keep moving on the what we believe. We did last week, started last week and talked about what God originally intended when he created the heavens and the earth, specifically what he was thinking about when he created man. And then we talked about the word of God a good bit and how he intended us all to be his children, his sons and daughters. That was his intention from the beginning. Uh, One thing about the word of God, we we talked in uh, a lot about how the Word of God scripturally is the person of Jesus, not necessarily the Bible. The Bible never calls itself the Word of God, but it consistently calls Jesus the Word of God. That's an important distinction to make. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really think about this last week, but I was thinking about it as I was preparing this week. You know, if the Bible is the Word of God, then for over 300 years, the church didn't have a, a word. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> so for 300 years, you know, and probably the most crucial time for the church, if the Bible was the word, what did the church have? And I would say that that's the reason why Jesus has to be the word, because that's who they had. And their revelation of him, their ongoing experience of him was their guiding light, was their revelation, their ongoing understanding. So I uh, talked a lot about that last week. I want to get into now the nature of man and then talk about sin, the cross, and salvation today. This is part two of what we believe. And uh, I just want to remind the WHO leaders, you are welcome to Uh, intersperse thoughts, because I'm sure you've done lots of study and preparation for this week. Look at you, all ready to go over there. So I I think there's only one microphone that has battery. That one there you're holding is dead. I forgot about that. Someone can run that, maybe get a new battery in it. Okay, so if you're new here, or if this is, you're just visiting or whatever, and you've been in church for a while, Something you've probably heard a lot, even if you aren't <clears throat> new here, <clears throat> excuse me, is that uh, fundamental Christianity believes that man was born sinful. That man was, depo- uh, was born, literally the, the term that's used in Reformed theology is depraved. And the scripture that is often you quoted to use to support that idea is Romans chapter 5, verse 12. So, if, Trey, if you can pull that up and put that on the screen today. Um, to start, uh, I just want you to know that the original church, <clears throat> the disciples, as well as the first several generations of the church did not believe that thought process. <clears throat> I'm sorry I keep doing that. And um, probably the theologian that originated this idea and brought forth the concept that Adam's sin was passed down to humanity, started with Augustine. Augustine um, had a version of the Bible, or had a version of Scripture, that was called the Latin Vulgate. Anybody ever heard of that term? Okay. And in specifically the book of Romans, where Paul wrote this, we have today, this is the New American Standard, and it's not my favorite Bible because Americans in it. Uh, It's my favorite version because... Now, it's not perfect by any means, but more often than not, the English words used are closely related, not always, but closely related to the original language of Scripture. And I think I shared this last week, but I want to reiterate. The original language and the original intention of the Scriptures is what I abide by. I, I go back, that's why we used the term radical theology last week, those of you that were here, Radical theology is not crazy fringe theology. Radical theology means original theology. What God originally had in mind is what I seek after and what we here seek after. So here, if you look at this, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered what? The world. This is really important for us to understand. When Adam and Eve chose to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil after the enticement of the serpent, sin was given a doorway into the world. It does not say anywhere in Scripture where sin entered into man. 
This is really important. Sin entered the world. So now we have two influences in the, in the earth. Prior to sin entering the world, there was one. There was the Father, and then when sin enters the world, there's another influence, another spirit at work. It goes on to say, and now death through sin, and so death spread to all men, not in all men. Because all sinned. That is an important difference between what we have today, which is that because all sinned is much more in line with the original language in the Greek than the Latin Vulgate version, which those of you that haven't, and there's even certain versions of the Bible still today <clears throat> that we read, King James is one of them, where instead of because all sinned, it says in whom all have sinned. Major difference between those two things. Think about it. Because all sinned gives each individual person the decision to sin. It's on each individual person to choose and decide to act outside of what God originally intended. I'll talk about sin in a little bit. But the version Augustine had, and Augustine was a huge influence on Martin Luther, so much so that Martin Luther was actually an Augustinian monk. They were very devout to the writings and studies of Augustine. So Augustine's version of the Bible that he read says, in whom all have sinned, which means in Adam we all sinned. Now that is classical theology for many of us, Growing up in the church, if you grew up like, my gosh, any Reformed theology from Baptist to Presbyterian to Lutheran and to many others, fundamental Christianity believes this, that Adam's sin was passed down to all of us through blood, and now no matter what you do, if you are conceived in your mother's womb, you are sinful. That comes from that Bad interpretation of Romans 5, verse 12, because the reality is, is death spread to all men because all have sinned. So I want to make sure that we're all clear here. Sin in us is not the result of a sin nature passed down from Adam. If it were, here's a really important question. How was Adam able to sin? If you sin because of a sin nature... And Adam was created by the hands of God and then breathed into by the mouth of God. How did Adam sin? And the answer is the exact same way you and I do. He chose it. He decided it. He was influenced and he sinned. Sin is a decision. This is a really important thing. If anyone's taking notes today, Sin is a decision man makes outside of relationship with his father. Really quick, Adam and Eve are in the garden, and every evening in the cool of the day, the father comes and walks with them, talks with them, and all of that. In a time when the father is not with them presently, in the present, the serpent comes and begins to sow seeds of doubt. And if you go and look at what the serpent says to Eve, the serpent never lies to her. But he plants seeds of doubt on the inside of her, causing her to doubt what the father's intentions were concerning this tree. And so what happens is Eve makes a decision outside of her relationship with the father and then causes Adam, the man, to do the same thing. And before long, the two of them now have a condition that is created void of the influence of the father. How are we doing so far? Good? We all sin in the same way Adam did influenced by someone other than the Father to walk outside of our original design and created intention. Over time, these decisions compile and they create a false version of ourselves putting our original identity to sleep. This is really important. So throughout the New Testament, you see this term flesh that Paul uses. How many people have seen that term before or heard a term used before? Okay. Now, for those of you that have been around a long time, I'm sorry, I'm going to repeat myself from things you've heard a lot, but it's really important that we establish foundations. What happened was God's original idea for any human being, then as a result of sin, begins to get layered on top with another identity that we were not originally meant to walk in. 
It's an orphan mentality, you can call it. It's a, it's a thought process and a way of life that was created by us, not by the Father. And over time, who we really are, who God thought about and then spoke into existence, gets literally caked over. Do you have the uh, drawing? Or the painting, I should say. The work of art created by people here among us. I'm just going to use this as a picture. I used to draw on a whiteboard, and they now hide the whiteboard from me <laughs> so that I can't draw anymore. But I want you to see this because this is a painting that uh, Lauren Diefenbach and Casey King created together based on this idea, and I'm trying to decide how deep I want to go into this. I need wisdom. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to tell you this. Write down, if you have it written down, or in your phone, put it in your notes, read Romans 7 and 8. Okay? Read Romans 7 and 8, and I'm going to, if you can remember this picture, and then read Romans, all right, I got it. I got to go there. I'm sorry. I can't, I actually feel like I would be a criminal. Literally, I'm not even kidding, if I did not show you this. Those of you that are going to do SOS here, coming up in a couple of weekends or in the summer, you're going to hear this again, and you're going to hear it ad nauseum and in great detail. <laughs> but I want you to see this here. All right, there is a famous passage of Scripture here in Romans chapter 7 where Paul begins to discuss like this uh, war on the inside of him. Anybody ever talk, ever read this before or heard about this before? Um, <clears throat> Let's see where do I want to start. Verse 15, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For I am practicing what I would, for I am not practicing what I would like to do. Do you hear that? I am not practicing what I would like to do. It's almost as if two different people are talking inside the same person. But I'm doing the very thing I hate. Does that sound familiar? In your own lives? Do you feel that war? Do you feel that? You know a good thing on the inside of you, but you find yourself feeling and doing another thing. I just want to make sure I'm in a human room. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. Earlier on in Romans 7, Paul is talking about how the law actually causes us to sin. Believe it or not. So now, no longer am I the one doing it. Let's just say that that I is the original Paul, the Paul God had in mind and spoke into existence, but sin which dwells in me. Now, if we stop there, look up from our Bibles, we could say, Mark, you're wrong. Sin dwells in us. That's why we sin, because it's deep on the inside of us. We can't get away from it. That is why it is. But we don't read the rest of it. Verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. See, Mark, there it is again. Nothing good dwells in me. I was born evil. I was born sinful. Keep reading. That is where? In my flesh. Now, that word flesh, if you go look it up, who can help me? Okay, Sarko or Sarx, S-A-R-X, and it means what, Amanda? What? The part to be removed. Ooh. It means it's not supposed to be there. It means someone else put it on. Guess who did? We did. Just like Adam and Eve, when they realized they were naked, what did they do? They covered themselves. That's a foreshadowing of what man will do when he realizes he does the exact same thing. Keep going. That is in my flesh. Look, for the willing is present in me. Where did that come from? Where did the willing come from? From God. And where is it? Uh-oh, you have a willingness to do good, and it's where? I submit to you that it's who you originally are, who God originally created you to be. I don't believe you were born sinful. I believe you were born willing to do good. Stay with me. The willing is present in me, but the doing of it is not. So just get this picture. Look, go back to the drawing. Sorry. Got to stay flexible with me, Trayer. I love you, man. So inside, see that bright, white, 
you, the one that God sees when he looks at you, the one that God celebrates and speaks life to and reminds you, just like we were singing earlier, when he looks at you, this is who he sees, and he reminds you of who you are. The problem is it's covered up by it looks really colorful and cool, but it's actually slimy and gross. The painting's right back there, by the way. It's in the dark, but it's back there. This is you. The willing to do good is inside, but the doing of it is not. So you have this willingness deep on the inside of you that wants to do good, but the problem is your, this flesh nature, it, it hinders your willingness. Now, I know you've had this, and I know I've had it too. Like, I'll be sitting there, and probably, are you married? Who's married? Okay, this is the, it's the greatest place for you to see your willingness to do good and not the doing of it. Anyone? Yeah, it's the person that's going to be the closest to you your whole life. It's the person that sees everything about you, the good and the bad. And it's there where you have the willingness to do good. Like you're looking at this person who you know you love and know loves you, and you think you want to kill them. <laughs> don't act like you don't. Come on, you said we were in a human room here today, right? You've had moments where you're like, oh my gosh, I love this person and I want to kill them all at the same time. And if you don't believe that, then talk about your kids. Don't tell me that hasn't happened with your kids. Amen. Now we're getting real. It's happened. It's part of being a human. Oh, parents. No, 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 no. We're not going there. It doesn't go the other way. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, that outer slimy dark nature. The willing is present in me, but the doing of it isn't. Because I want to do good, but then it's got to come through this nature that doubts, that fears, that doesn't trust, that wants to protect all the time. For the good that I want to do, I do not do. Where did the good that you want to do come from? God, who's he talking to here? He's talking to believers. He's talking to those who believe, yet they're still struggling against sin. I do not do the very good that I want to do, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. If I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. <gasps> You're justifying yourself, Paul. Yes, he is. He's making a clear delineation that there is a person on the inside of him, a true son of the Father who wants to do good, and then sin hinders him. So far, so good? Sin which dwells in me. We saw earlier that sin doesn't dwell in his, who he really is. It dwells in his flesh, because he just said that a verse earlier. I find then, verse 21, the principle that evil is present in me, Look at this, the one who wants to do good. And I want to tell you, you don't have to be a Christian to feel this. You're a human being, and you feel this. Come on, someone say amen. amen. You remember feeling this way before you believed in Jesus, for those of you that weren't saved at one, that weren't born into this? Do you remember feeling like, I know it's the good thing to do, but still I fight against it. Jump up here anytime. Is it working? Yeah, I Oh, okay. For I joyfully concur with the law of God where? In the inner man. In, in bright shining, dude, if that was up here. I'm sorry. We, I know. I'm killing Treyer right now. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a what? Oh, you got to put that picture up now. Now you got to put that picture up. Making me a prisoner. Look, the who you really are is a prisoner. Now just look at the picture and I'll read. Waging a war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am. Look at the picture. Who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In other words, Jesus is going to do it. And then I want to go into Romans 8 so much. Oh, God, how do I stop? Stop me. I'm like an addict. I can't stop. 
That's why he says, therefore now there is no condemnation, verse 1, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So what Jesus does, this is the beauty of Jesus. You better stop me. I'm, I, okay. Jesus doesn't just love bright, white, shining you. This is so important for you to understand. For God so loved the world. And that world is the cosmos. It's the stuff. It's the smelly, stinky stuff God created. I'm sorry, man created and the man God created. He loves it all. He says, the only way I'm going to be able to set him free from this body of death is if I love it. I want to tell you something. God had to take it all in and say, I love it all in order to deal righteously with your sin. You think about it. It doesn't mean he approves of our sin. He just knew that hatred of it and despising of it wasn't going to heal you from it. He has to love it out of you. So he literally embraces all of that. Oh, there's so much here. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you, white, bright, shining you, free from the law of sin and death. Is anybody else excited about that? Are we good? So far, so you got more? You got? Yeah, go. All right. Um, so I guess we have to ask the question, what's in there? What's in the white? Like, what is that light that's actually in man? And I think Jesus actually tells us exactly what's in. Um, and if you go to, you don't have to go there, I'll read it for you. Yeah. Um, but just look, look faster. Up yeah. So Matthew chapter 5, right? Jesus is about to give his first sermon. He's just come out of, you know, uh, fasting and, and that time in the wilderness. And, he's, and it says there, when Jesus saw the crowds. And actually, it's a, it, this is the NASB too. But it's a really poor translation of that word. Because it gives this connotation that Jesus just like, he saw this great group of people and was like, okay, now I have to. Now I have to say something. But that's not truly the meaning of that word. What it says there is Jesus perceived or discerned the crowd. So he actually spent some time looking at that crowd and seeing and taking an inventory of who was there. And once he takes an inventory, he gives the Beatitudes. And in the Beatitudes, he shows us what the true nature of man is. And the true nature of man is poor in spirit sensitive to the point that they would mourn. The true nature is gentle, hunger and thirsting for righteousness. The true nature of man is merciful. The true nature of man is pure in heart. The true nature of man is that they are peacemakers. So this is what God, this is what Jesus is seeing even before he went up onto the cross and died for what we, for our sins and rose. Even before that he said that, he perceived and discerned in man all those things that are yearning to come out that are caked in by all the stuff we have decided to put around it. I can't mourn because I need to be strong. I can't be gentle because of the law. I can't be poor in spirit because, well, I know. Mm -hmm. All those things, and you think it's just sin that cakes over? It's actually our false understanding of a father who loves us that adds on to that caking that doesn't allow us to come out of it. It's like every religious thing, everything that's, that's like... <clears throat> everything that just puts a penalty on your behavior... Like that kind of legalistic thing is that mortar that seeps in, into the bricks of false understanding. And everything inside you is everything he said in the Beatitudes when he perceived and discerned the people. That's what you're yearning to come out. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, <laughs> you opened it. And this is not just a question of semantics, okay? This is not, because I, I thought about that this week, like, this is not a, well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? This is not a question of, like, because there is sin, and we know, but, like, it is how we see ourselves. We have to see ourselves. That's why this is so important, because we see ourselves how the Father sees us. And when our eyes, 
and our heart comes from this position, then we see the rest of the world this way, and now we're not drawing a line of separation. That's why it's so important that we understand the, um, the position that the Father sees us in with this. So please don't, this is not a question of semantics. I'll be quick on this. Um, this is a plug for Wednesday, too, in our foundations class. We're going to talk about sonship. But, you know, when Ben started off talking, or he prayed this morning about different idols, and during worship, I couldn't help but think, like, we can feel trapped in this thing. And, you know, as you read the scripture, and Paul's even wrestling with it, and we're like, oh, my goodness, this guy wrote, like, most of the New Testament, and here he's confessing this internal struggle. And, like, I would, I would propose to you what, like, I'm finding is, like, if this pillar, I was seeing this pillar is like my sin, and we're like, all right, I got to fix it, right? Like, I got to, I got to, I'm going to rip this down, God, and then I'm going to spend time with you because I got to get rid of my sin. And I think if we would go embrace him, like, like a house that's not, like, lived in falls apart, right? Like, it just, like, right. weeds grow up and it falls down, like... So this is just my personal revelation. Like, instead of, like, fighting this monster anymore, I'm just going to, like, try to embrace God more. That's it. And, like, yeah. yeah, to me, that's just the trick of helping that white guy get out of the middle. Excellent. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, right along with what Chuck was saying, uh, when the Lord gave me this, this vision of this. Um, By the way, he's one of the co-painters. Yeah. Um, at first I saw, all I saw was, was the sarco around. And then later when me and Lauren were painting it, the Lord brought me back, and this time his hands were around it. And I was like, well, what does that mean? And, and he kind of just quickened me, reminded me that um, he's not pulling it away. Like, that's our decision and our choice to, to get rid of the flesh and to choose him. But he's just there supporting us and with his grace empowering who we really are on the inside to overcome that. Um, so I completely agree with what, what Chuck said. Like, if we focus on the sin and focus on what's wrong with us, we're not focusing on truth because that's not who we really are. We've got to focus on who the Father made us, who he is in us, and his grace that empowers Excellent. us to walk Excellent. in his spirit. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah. So if you read the rest of Romans 8, which I, I got to stop somewhere. So just here's the joy of Romans 8. Romans 8 is the spirit of the Lord goes on the inside of us. Remember how I said last week, he is with us, on us, and in us. His inward work is to empower and awaken and strengthen who we really are. And then we, like the butterfly in the cocoon, go, because if he does it, our wings are weak. But if we do it, we fly. That's the difference. So he, it says the spirit, how, you put to death, how do you put to death the deeds of the flesh? By the spirit. And the spirit dwelling with our spirit, we then revolutionize and recognize that we're sons of God, like Chuck said, and we begin to walk as such. And we're focused on who we are, not who we're not. Really quick. Two misused scriptures for those of you that have grown up this whole time with this classical theology that man's depraved. Psalm 51, 5, David. Remember, I was conceived in what? Sin, Sin. yes. So, if David used the word joy instead of sin, what would you think? <laughs> think, yeah, hubba hubba. Right? If he would have said, I was conceived in sadness, what would you think David meant? Come on, someone. Okay, that was kind of weird, but. <laughs> Do you understand, if you go and look at Psalm 51.5 really quick, you'll recognize that the psalmist David is not talking about him. He's talking about the nature in which he was conceived. He was conceived in sin. Can I tell you that almost all rabbinical teachers now agree that David was a bastard? <laughs> he was not Jesse's son. Proof of that is why wasn't he lined up with the other sons when Samuel came to anoint them? Isn't that interesting? And after Samuel goes down past all five, he goes, are there any more? Well, I got one out in the field. 
Jesse's like, he's not really mine. Bring him here. And as soon as David walks in the room, wow, wow. The point is, that is not a good scripture to use because the conception has nothing to do with David. It has to do with the act in which the conception took place. Go. Yeah, and God still used him. Yeah, God like still used him. He loved God more than probably Absolutely. any Old Testament character. Absolutely. The other one, and I would like to go there with Jeremiah 17. I am so thankful for Trey. Can everyone just give Trey a hand really quick? Just tell him he's awesome. Thank you very much. Jeremiah 17. This is a fun one, and you probably, at some point in time in your church history, have read this. Let me see, where do I want to start? Uh, verse 5, Jeremiah 17. Well, the, the verse I want to get to is this verse. 9, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Who's heard that one before? Major scripture used to describe us as born sinful. Look at the context. Verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. So if a heart turns away from the Lord, where was it originally? At the Lord. Oh, interesting, isn't it? When a sheep goes astray, where was he before he went astray? With the shepherd. For he will be like a bush in the desert and will not see when prosperity comes and will live in stony wastes in the wilderness, a land of salt without inhabitant. Ugh, that's ugly. Verse 7, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. He will be like a tree planted by the water, extend its roots down by the stream. He will not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor cease to yield fruit. Then he says... The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Look at verse 10. Key verse. I, the Lord, do what? Why would he need to search the heart if they're all dark, wicked, and depraved anyway? He says, even I test the mind to give to each man according to his ways and according to the results of his deeds. He's looking at the hearts of men, seeing if their heart is turned toward him or away from him. That word there, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Both of those words speak. And this is a term I really want you guys to understand. This is where I feel like English language sticks in comparison to ancient languages because of how beautifully descriptive they are and how stale the English language is. Because this language really talks about how the heart is vulnerable, how the heart is frail and easily taken. It's actually like a military term where like a hill that's easily taken. You guys ever heard that term in the military? Let's go take that hill. Well, it's a hill that's just like this, and you're on it. The heart is purposely vulnerable. Now, just think about it. From the Lord's perspective, he creates a heart vulnerable. Why? So that that can easily be influenced by him. He's not going to change his original design because of a mistake someone makes. His original design is he makes his heart vulnerable so that it'll be easily influenced by the Lord. The problem is it's also easily influenced by other influences. Do you guys hear that? That's really what it's saying here. He's actually saying the heart is more susceptible than all else and is desperately feeble or vulnerable. And that's why it's describing the man who trusts in man and in the flesh, easily turned toward the flesh. Man who trusts in the Lord, strong, roots planted in the waters. You guys with me? Good. Those are just two verses. I know there's others, but I can do that with all of them. And I'm so glad that it's this way. You guys good? All right. Uh, just so you know, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit while still in the womb of Elizabeth. How is that possible? And here's the thing that really messes with my brain, and I don't understand why people would believe this. If a baby dies in the womb, if a child dies before they can verbally say yes to Jesus, what happens to them? We believe that. We believe that. But if you believe that a child's originally born sinful and depraved, you have to recreate You've got to recreate a theology to help sustain the idea that innocent ones go to hell. 
And so you create, anybody know it? Age of, age of accountability. It is not scriptural. There's nothing in the Bible that talks about an age of accountability. It's, a, it's to explain away the concept that a child or, even worse, aborted fetuses go to hell because they didn't give a chance to say yes to Jesus. Impossible. If that is the God we worship, I want nothing to do with him. And I know it's not. Are we good? So, motivated by the Father's love for the whole world, Jesus enters the world to restore man to his original intended nature, which is the image of God. And he heals the interruption and uncomplicates man's ability to walk as God's son or daughter. Grace is the vehicle he offers. Sin, let's talk about this really quick. Sin, the Greek word is hamarteno. Sorry, I don't know how to say that very well. Harmarteno. And it's a word that means to miss the mark. Someone is dinging away over there. Is there a lot of important texts coming in? That's good. Good. I hope it's important. To miss the mark. So don't think about this. If the original word is to miss the mark, then it has everything to do with original intention. Sin takes us off the original aim takes us off our original walk and causes us to hit something else. And it actually means to miss out on the prize. To sin means not only do I miss my intended mark, but I also miss out on the benefit of walking like I should. We'll talk about that another time. Um, actually, I do want to talk about sin a little bit. Sin is mentioned in the Bible a lot, so it's kind of a big deal. And, but it's not a... It's not a big deal for what we think it's a big deal. And I think James um, chapter 4 gives us the best um, description of what, what that is. So, it, And you don't have to go. It's so short. Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him, it is sin. And I, the, the, I love this verse and how it breaks it down because it, do, it takes it out of a list of things to do or do not do and makes it extremely personal. Now, it's not about the thing you do or do not do. It's about the thing you know or the one that you know. So if you came up to me and asked me, hey, is this sin? I first have to have a conversation with you about what you know. And that's a way more important conversation than is this sin or is this not sin? Now, the Bible gives us a lot of things that we should know are sin. You should go check those out. I'm not going to list them here for you. But it also gives room in this verse for the Father to teach us what is right and what is not right. And when the Father teaches us and when the Spirit downloads us into us what is the right thing, when we don't do that, it is sin. Right. So it's important not to, like, everything... The Old Testament laws are not contained in there. They're like volumes and volumes and volumes of books that tell us what the actual Old Testament law is. Within, in the New Covenant, it's do I know the Lord and am I producing what I know of the Lord? So sin to me, um, it's not so much that you didn't do the thing that you were supposed to do. It's that you know something that you refuse to surrender to him. That's a really good point. Psalm 139 says, my soul knows full well. Mm -hmm. You guys remember that? He says he was fearfully and wonderfully made, which, by the way, another great verse for how you were created. And it says, my soul knows full well. That's the part inside of you that knows good, that knows right, and knows full well. And, but then what happens is that thing over time, because you just do whatever the H you want to do, that goes to sleep. And over time, you actually begin to quiet the willingness to do good, the righteousness on the inside of you. You put it to sleep, and sin begins to be the louder voice. You do know. I know. And if I, if I continue to sin, it's, a, it's, it's like this mark around this thing that I just have not surrendered to the Father. Yeah. Like I call myself a son, but I've reserved this portion of my life over here for myself, and I haven't given it over to the Father. And the Lord's like, if you only knew, not like blaming you and saying, oh, well, you know, you don't know any better. More like if you only knew the benefit of knowing. If you only knew, it's like you would do it. 
if you truly knew. And it's not a knowing like, it's a knowing from here. Like, um, the actual definition is, it is the force of knowing. Hmm. It is the force of knowing the thing that has been described. That's how it's, how it's written out in, in definition. So there is a force in you, and I don't know, maybe you could call that conscience, or whatever you want to call it. There's a force in you that knows. And when you decide to turn away from that thing, well, now you're unsafe. All right. Good. So sin, really, if you look at it biblically, it's life lived apart from God. Repentance is a turn from sin and a return to Him and the life we were attended, intended to live by Him. Uh, Pastor Renee from Costa Rica, when I put out some things about, you know, what would you like to hear about, he asked about the difference between freedom and lawlessness. I think that's a really important thing. Because another definition of sin in the Bible is lawlessness, like a law unto yourself. Like you don't have anyone else to live for or unto, so you do whatever is right in your own eyes. Another great definition of sin. And I think the greatest thing I can kind of give you is the difference between freedom and lawlessness is this. Freedom is a Holy Spirit-driven process. Just think, listen to this. By which the human soul is restored to be and do that which it was originally created. Lawlessness is man's doing what he feels is right in his own eyes. God is the standard of freedom. Man's thoughts and feelings are the standard of lawlessness. So, if you do whatever you want, however you're feeling in the moment, you're lawless. True freedom is not doing whatever you want. True freedom, biblically, is the Spirit has come to set you free. And free you shall be, or free indeed you shall be. So true freedom is being led and living by the spirit of the one who originally created you. Do you hear the difference? Big difference. So the reason why Jesus died, this is huge, and I want to talk about the cross, and then we're going to stop today. Because I need to talk about the cross. Because there is a really bad theology, and I'm just going to call it bad because it is. It is a bad theology, and it's called penal substitution. Don't get weird. <laughs> penal meaning penalty. Penal meaning judicial. Penal meaning law. There is an idea, fundamental Christianity believes this wholeheartedly, that Jesus had to die to fulfill the law. And as a result, because of Jesus' death, God's willing to make a deal with man. Now God's anger and God's wrath toward man, man is satisfied because Jesus' blood is shed. That sounds, how many people have heard that as a reason for Jesus' death? Yeah, I know I did too. And, and I know you can make a legal argument for that biblically, but penal substitution is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want to talk about this for a minute. Jesus' death was not payment to God for sin. God did not require payment because he forgave us. I want to let that settle in. I want to put it this way. How many people have a mortgage? Gosh. It's like a bad word. But anyway. If the bank came to you and said, hey, I want to let you know, Here's the deed to your house. Someone came and wrote a check and paid off your house for you. Would you be excited? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'd be really excited. Another scenario. The bank comes to you and says, we forgive your loan. Here's the deed to your house. Would you be happy? Yeah. Heck, yeah, I'd be happy. Are they the same thing? No. no. They're very different. One is a deal. One is a contract that was fulfilled that someone else had to carry out for you. Another one is the one who held you in bondage, decided to not hold you anymore. Forgiveness. My God is not a deal maker. My God is a forgiver. I want you to hear this. When Jesus died, let's, go to, let's just think about the verse that we probably all know without even having to read it. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. 
Anybody want to repeat it for me? Okay, I'll read it. For all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Have all been in sin? Just going back. No, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Does anybody know what comes right after that? Okay, go to the next verse. You're right, Amanda. Being justified as a gift by His grace. Is there any way to put both those verses up at the same time? Is that impossible? I, I just so I so believe in His skills and His gifts that I just believe He can do it. Okay, who sinned in verse 23? All. all. That all applies to verse 24. Who's justified? There we go. For all have sinned. You are awesome, Trevor. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified. You, look, this is really important for us to understand. We think that we have to repent in order for God's forgiveness to apply to us. That is backwards. That's a deal. That's a deal. That says, I'm going to withhold my forgiveness until Keith Eberly says I repent. That's a deal. That's not how God works. In Jesus, God forgave man. Yes. Period. This is going to sound strange to you if you never heard this. If you're in Reformed theology and fundamental Christianity, this is going to sound strange to you. Man is forgiven whether they believe or not. Now that does not mean they get to go to heaven. That does not mean that eternity is theirs. It means that from God's perspective, clean. You're mine. There's no dividing wall between you and I anymore. I am fully reconciled to you. Man still has a choice in the matter. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever should believe in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. The next verse goes on to say, But those who saw the light, some embraced it, and others loved their darkness more than their light. You hear that? It's man's choice. In fact, Jesus even goes on to say, the judgment has already been done. Go ahead, go read John. Most of us stop at 16, but 17 and 18 talk about, I didn't come to judge the world. I came to save it. The one I came to judge is being judged. Who do you judge? Satan, the devil. How are we doing? I know I'm going fast and I feel bad for going fast, but this is really important. God, I'm just going to read some things I wrote here because it's important that you hear them. God is the initiator of forgiveness. God does not respond to what we do. We respond to what God does. Our repentance is in response to God's love, not the condition for it. Jesus was a declaration of a father's love for all of his ch children as well as, this is what the cross did, was a permanent destruction to the devil and his works. 1 John. The true gift to God that we give to God is to wash and make ourselves clean. Just trying to decide how much I want to read here. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians I want everyone, if you have a Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Because this is something that's really important. Jesus' death on the cross was substitutionary. It was Him experiencing death so we don't have to. Jesus literally surrendered Himself to man's wrath not God's wrath. This is really important for us to understand. Jesus was not experiencing God's wrath on the cross. Jesus was experiencing the worst man had to offer. I really need you guys to hear this because penal substitution theory would say that Jesus endured God's wrath concerning sin. That is not true. There's something else penal substitution theory says, and that is this. The Father could not look at Jesus on the cross. The Father had to separate Himself from Jesus on the cross. There are so many theological problems with that idea. Here's one of them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the, the 
Ministry of reconciliation. Maybe it's the verse before it or the verse after it. Then. What's the next verse? Namely, there it is, that God, who's God? The Father was where? In who? In who? In Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. Where was Jesus doing that? On the cross. The Father cannot separate himself. I and the Father are one. I am in him. He is in me. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, now not counting their trespasses against them. And now he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. You were forgiven before you repented. This is so important. The love of God is towards you, and that's what causes us to repent. It's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Someone say, how? Say something good. Man, you're too white for me. Now, one of the main ones. Then why did Jesus cry out on the cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. Okay, I know it's late. No, it's not really that late. No, we're good. Turn to Psalm 22. Now, while you're turning there, I want you to know that it's rabbinical. Now, if you got to go, you got to go. I understand that. Go for it. You're just going to miss out. So... <laughs> If you were a Jew in that day, you would know that when a rabbi would say the first line of a psalm, what was supposed to happen next? They were supposed to say the rest. In rabbinical law, in synagogue meetings, when the rabbi would say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You would then read the rest or speak the rest of the psalm. So, we can even say that Jesus really did feel and experience what he felt there when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's going through pain. The worst physical suffering I think any man could go through. Yeah, I believe his heart and flesh cried out to him, the living God. Now, if you read Psalm 22, verse 1, and say, oh, far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. In other words, I'm in pain, and I'm suffering, and my deliverance is far from me, and the God who delivers me is far from me. Can I save you time, and can we just go down to verse 24? Because anyone that heard him say verse 1 of Psalm 22 knew what verse 24 said. For he, God, has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, what? He heard. God was near Jesus. So near he was in him. I believe this with all of my heart, the same scars Jesus has, the Father has. The same pain Jesus felt, the Father felt. The Father's children. Does anybody, hey, how many parents in the room again? How many people have felt the pain of their children? Moms. Every mom should better say amen. I remember labor, baby. I want you to know the child feels that pain too. And when a child hurts themselves, whether it's in their own heart or whether it's when they're playing, I want to tell you, that hurts even to the point of this, and I know this might sound like kids are like, whatever, but when you're being disciplined, it is painful to the parent. I know you don't think so, but it is. Not only does it take energy <laughs> from what we're really supposed to be doing, but it's actually painful. We don't want to inflict pain on our children. So the father purposefully wanted to feel in Jesus everything that it felt like to be in sin. That's why Jesus came. I needed to feel everything they feel. And that's why he was able to be a good mediator of this covenant. How are we doing? So far so good? All right. I really want you guys to understand this. The horrible suffering Jesus withstood was at the hands of men, not God. I actually think it was in the worst that man could offer that Jesus gave forth his best. All right. 
Let me just talk about salvation really quick. <laughs> talk about salvation really quick. I believe believing in Jesus and salvation are not biblically equal. Let's just go to the one story in Acts where Paul and Silas are in prison. You guys remember this? And then the earthquake hits the prison and all the doors fly open and everybody runs out except Paul and Silas. And the jailer's like, oh my gosh, I'm in big trouble <laughs> because I just lost all of these prisoners. And Paul and Silas cry out. He's about to kill himself. You guys remember this? And Paul and Silas cry, whoa, 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 don't, 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 don't do that. And so they, he comes and they're still in their jail cell. And he says he falls at his knees. Remember what he asks? What does the jailer ask? What must, what must I do to be saved? Now, it's important. I want you guys to know this. That, that word saved is the Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O. And if you've been around here a while, you know that word means healed, restored, made whole. The important word, delivered. Delivered, healed, restored, and made whole. That's what the word sozo means. What must I do to be delivered, healed, restored, and made whole? That's what he's asking. And so he says, or Paul's response is this, what? Believe in the Lord Jesus, which is really important. So believe in the Lord Jesus. Someone? Anybody remember what the rest of it is? And you shall be saved, you and your household. Really important. Believing and saves are two different things. Believing is the doorway by which the work of salvation begins to happen in our lives. That's why the later one of the epistle writers says this, be saved daily. Salvation is an ongoing work on the inside of the human being. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Because I've had people ask around here at World Harvest, why don't you got more altar calls? Why don't you have more people come up and accept the Lord Jesus as their Savior? I'm going to tell you why. It's a work of the Spirit. I talk about Him all the time. You want to hear about Him? I'll talk about Him all the time. But I will not force you to fall in love with someone that you haven't met yet. You think about this. And Look, look I'm just going to be honest with you. I was saved from door-to-door -door evangelism. Me. College campus, Shippensburg University, guy knocked on 72 doors, knocked on doors, preached the gospel to as many people as would listen to him, and three months later I gave my heart to the Lord, and he was the start of it. But I can tell you this, I will not force you, but if you come to me and you say, something's going on on the inside of me, I don't know what it is, I will help you find it. I will help, you show, I will help show you who it is that's doing that. But I think what we have done with salvation, we have made it the number one focus of the evangelical church. And it was not the focus of Jesus or the disciples. The kingdom of God was. The full restoration of man and God's in, um, image in him and the fullness of the kingdom, which is the rule and reign of Jesus on the planet. That was the focus. Go look at it. Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. Not repent and be saved. We, we highlight John 3.16, but Jesus talks much more about the kingdom. Much more. Because the kingdom is the result of a restored life. Think about it. Righteousness, peace, and joy, that's what Romans says, is the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom is not eating and drinking. That's lawlessness. Just hear me out on that. doesn't mean if you eat and drink, you're lawless. But if you look at the whole of that chapter in Romans, the Kingdom is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So as the work of being delivered, healed, restored, and made whole takes place in your life, the kingdom of God begins to manifest through you. That's the goal of heaven. That's why when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray, he said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth, as it is in heaven. How does heaven invade earth? Through a sozoed life. You start with belief in Jesus, and then you spend the rest of your life, if we had that picture back up on the screen, being restored and made whole. Slowly, 
that person on the inside of you awakening, being empowered by His Spirit, walking in the nature and character that God originally created you to walk in, His nature and character, shedding everything of this world and establishing the kingdom of God on the earth. That's your destiny. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, Casey. In the same way Jesus was sent, so also are we, to extend and, uh, extend and establish the kingdom of God. So salvation is not a one-time event, but a lifelong process of revelation and maturation. You must believe in Jesus, which releases the Holy Spirit from simply being with us to now being in us. Because you cannot say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. How are we doing? We good? All right, really quick. If you got to go, go. Do you have any questions? Or any comments? Pastor Mark, that was just you preaching good sermon. Thank you, Jason. Died again? again? All right, just shout. It's a feminine noun, and it talks about deliverance and that delivery. So it's, it, salvation is that very feminine side of the Father. That I mean, we talk about God the Father. He's spirit, and he doesn't have a, a, a gender, but that salvation part is that part, that feminine part of, of um, him that delivers us through. Yeah, fathers can be feminine. Yeah. I labor, I am again in labor, Paul says, until Christ is formed in, in you. you. Yeah. And I think the thing about it is if you ask about deliverance or if you think about that word deliverance, you have to almost ask, well, what am I del being delivered from and what am I being delivered to? You have to ask that question. Um, and I, I think what's really important, what we have to get into our mind, that we, stop ha we have to stop telling the world, like, salvation is deliverance from hell because that's not the case. That's right. That's not the case. We, we're selling them a lie because at that point, if you're, you, you, you have salvation and you're delivered from hell, then the rest of your life is what? It's so much more important to understand that you've been delivered to life. Yeah. You, you have salvation to life. And that life then brings you back all the way to the original design where God said to Adam and Eve what? Go and subdue the earth. Have dominion over the earth. So salvation is the process of remembering exactly what God designed you to so that you could do the thing that he commissioned you to do all the way in the beginning. That's right. That's what true salvation is. It's not this saving you from hell. It's actually, you, actually bringing you out of death to life. Here, now. Not, oh, one day I'm not going to be in a fiery pit and I'm so happy about that. Like, all right, that's great. But what are you doing now? And salvation should truly manifest in how we subdue the earth. If you question your salvation, you should more question, well, what is the influencing influence I'm having over everything around me? My job, my work, my family. Am I bringing life to these things? Right. Yeah, Jesus came to give us life and to give it to us more abundantly. We're sent in the same way Jesus is sent, which means that life should be flowing from us into every sphere that we are in. So when you leave here today, and wherever it is you go, today, Monday, and throughout the week, is life being released from you. Salvation is the increasing engine on the inside of you to produce that abundant life and share it with everyone. Out of him who believes shall flow what? Rivers of living water. Come on, they're inside of you. Let's break forth and let them come out. Amen? Okay, next week I'm going to talk about hell and heaven. You know, one thought I have for you, specifically as it relates to heaven and hell. I want you to do this study on your own. I'm not going to give you the answer now. Does the Bible teach that the human soul is eternal prior to Jesus? Just a thought. 
Does the Bible teach that the human soul is eternal prior to your belief in Jesus? Go study that out, look it up. It's going to help you a lot with your understanding of heaven and hell. And then some other ones that are really good. Love you guys. Hope this is helpful.